program tonight. Mary. 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 Can't hear you. Oh. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. Now is this okay? How about this? Is that loud enough? Yeah, eat it. Like, like almost yeah. eat it. <laughs> now is it loud enough? That's is it? Okay. <laughs> well, once again, welcome everyone. And I have a couple of announcements to make before we get started. And we always start a meeting with a prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. But before we do that, I just wanted to welcome Cynthia Sheely. Where'd she go? I'm right over here. Okay, she, she's the new reporter on the beat for the Torrington Telegram. Do you want to stand up and welcome? Thank you so much for coming. And I even got your name right this time. <laughs> and also, um, in case you uh, have any um, questions about the historical society at this level or the state level, Pat Ellis is the one to ask um, any questions that you might have. And um, also Dean McLean, who I know he's here someplace. He's down here. <laughs> Stand up, Dean, so everyone can see you. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> he is responsible for calendar sales throughout the um, the community. So if you have any questions about calendars or want to see what they look like, I have some right here on, sitting on the chair that you can look at afterwards. And last but not least is Deb Davidson, who is on the board. I don't see her here tonight, but she is responsible for our new Facebook. So if you want to check out the Facebook, please be sure to do so. And, and one more thing. The, um, we tried a contest for children this summer and it was very disappointing when only two really followed through to the very end. But they were thrilled to get their $25 checks, and they had a major article in the Torrington Telegram, which is right here. These two little guys, they were really thrilled, and Marie Hamilton did a fabulous job covering every possible thing that could be said about this contest. Well, it... Um, is now going to be featured in the Wyoming News in the November issue. And so these two children are going statewide for 1,500 people, and I can't wait to tell them. <laughs> They'll be so thrilled, and I am too, frankly. So with all that being said, um, we'll say a prayer and then Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Lord, may we always be grateful for the freedoms we enjoy and never take them for granted. Help us to strive to improve your world wherever we are planted. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now, Pat, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Mary is our, our president, and you could not ask for a better president. She does so many things for us. Yes. And now I'd like to recognize our presentator tonight, Matt Berry, and his, he's the son of Kale and Chuck Berry, and they're here tonight. They have the ranch out north of Torrington. And he's going to give us a presentation from the American Revolutionary War to the Goshen County, Wyoming. And I heard a bit of this at one of our ladies clubs out there, and it is marvelous. You'll all enjoy this immensely. So, 
if Matt would like to say things about himself, why, I'll just give him the mic. <laughs> I usually hate using these microphones. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Did it go? Yeah. All right. So I just want to say thank you to the Goshen County Historical Society for inviting me here to uh, give this presentation this evening about uh, some of our Berry family history, the legacy uh, that started in the American Revolutionary War and progressed all the way uh, to the present here in, in Goshen County. So a little bit about me. Yep, I grew up on the Berry Ranch north of Torrington. Uh, I graduated from University of Wyoming, did 21 years in the Wyoming Army National Guard, and during that time I deployed twice to Iraq and Kuwait, and I retired from all of that about a year and a half ago, and I currently work over at uh, Camp Guernsey as a civilian military contractor, and I've been doing that for about 11 years, so that's me in a nutshell. I've got my uh, wife back here, Carrie, and uh, they couldn't make it this evening, but I've got a stepdaughter, Hannah, and her husband, TC, and three grandkids, uh, Madeline, Charlie, and Teddy, and they live up in Casper. Doesn't like that. Uh, and like Pat said, I've got uh, quite a few family members here, so I just want to introduce them real quick as well. So starting off with my dad, Chuck, Charles, or Bumper. He'll answer to one of those three names there. <laughs> and my mom, Kale and my dad's sister and my aunt Elaine Barry Griffith she came down from Lust this evening and I've got my sister Casey Barry Smith and her husband Travis and then my two nephews Hayden and <laughs> Mason back in the back there Your grandma. 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 oh yeah and my grandmother sorry about that <laughs> Gra granny Carol granny Peterson she and um, thank you for uh, making it out tonight this is a pretty big group. wasn't quite expecting that, but uh, appreciate everybody coming out to uh, to see uh, about about our legacy here. <clears throat> so we're going to start off with the family tree. On this slide, we've got eight generations of uh, Berry ancestors, starting at the top. Uh, I'm just going to go through all of these tonight, and we're going to stop here at my grandfather's generation, who was uh, Walt Walter Willison Berry. Uh, just because of time, we don't have enough time to talk about everyone, and of course, everyone down here, we're all still living and writing history as we speak, so uh, we'll we'll leave it at that. On the left-hand side, uh, that illustration there just is a depiction of the ancestors and, and where they started off. So we've got quite a few that uh, originated there in, in Pennsylvania where they settled. And then they transitioned here to uh, the west with my great grandfather who I was named after, Matthew Willison Berry. They also called him Bill, Bill Berry. So during the presentation, if I say Bill, that's who we're talking about. And he's the one who moved from Pennsylvania to the west uh, in Colorado and then ultimately ending up here in Goshen County. So one thing that uh, that makes this really fascinating for me is I do love history a lot and this all kind of started when my dad talked about this uh, our grandmother who picked up a rifle and fought in the Revolutionary War and I just found that pretty amazing because how many people can say that uh, a female relative picked up the rifle back in the 1600s, 1700s and, and fought in the war for independence? Probably not, not too many people. So even as a young kid, I, I found that very fascinating as I grew up. I just yearned for more information and, and this is really kind of where, where this uh, led to, uh, was a kind of a culmination tonight with uh, finding out all the ancestors history and all that. And then probably the cream on top, the cherry, uh, was last year, uh, my parents, my wife, and Casey and I, we went over, took a trip to Pennsylvania, and actually got to uh, see where all of our ancestors are buried, and uh, take the history that we knew about, and uh, walk in those steps, take the pictures, and really get a good idea real time, um, and make history basically come alive. So that was... That was pretty cool. I, I love when that all comes together. So John, Barry, and Elizabeth Gilmore. Great, 
great 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 grandfather and grandmother they both came from Ireland that's where the story begins so John uh, boarded a ship and uh, landed there in in Pennsylvania somewhere around Philadelphia uh, he was by himself and his whole purpose was to come fight in the war for independence um, not quite sure you know he's probably well he didn't like what the British were doing with the taxation and the tyranny and everything that they were dealing to the uh, colonists he didn't appreciate that so really that's why he came over because he wanted to you know kind of show the British because you know Britain and Ireland really didn't get along very well because uh, Great Britain treated Ireland about the same way or even more poor than than the colonists so uh, that's what motivated him to come to uh, America and then grandmother uh, Elizabeth Gilmore she came with her family and uh, they settled and started farming here in Lancaster County uh, family story kind of doesn't really give us a good picture on when these two met uh, some say that they sailed on the same ship and got to know each other and that's when their uh, relationship and romance kind of began and then it continued on when they were both at Valley Forge together and then other folks say that it didn't happen until they were at Valley Forge so uh, that's still up in the air. <laughs> so I'm going to do one more thing here. All right, so that's the whole reason I put this map up, just to give you an orientation on what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. So of course we got the state of Pennsylvania. We got Philadelphia down here in the corner. Valley Forge is about 25 miles away from there. You got Lancaster County uh, in this area here. And then Cannonsburg is south of Pittsburgh on the western part of, of the state. <clears throat> so John Barry, born in Dublin, he was an apprentice, a shoemaker. And then when he came over to America, he took up farming. Uh, him and Elizabeth were married in 1780. They had eight children. Everybody had a lot of kids back then. Uh, his military service, I'm going to break this down into two pieces. The first part is, well, he served for four years starting in 1776. And uh, he initially enlisted as a private with the 10th Pennsylvania Regiment. And uh, he did that for a couple of years until March of 1778 when uh, the Continental Army entered, uh, were actually at Valley Forge at that time. And, uh, and then he was selected as a lifeguard for General George Washington, which is basically his personal security detachment. <clears throat> and like I said, we'll break that down a little bit more in detail. So before they hit uh, Valley Forge, he did fight in the battles of uh, Brandywine and Paoli. Those all occurred a couple months before they entered Valley Forge in the winter in December. So back in those days, uh, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of, well, there were no photographs unless they were hand-drawn and whatnot. So really the only description that we have of John Barry is uh, somebody said uh, that he was a heavy-set Irishman with large front teeth. So that's, <laughs> that's what we got for, for John. And of course here in the picture, again, I mentioned it, that we were able to uh, visit all the cemeteries and, and see every single headstone from first generation all the way down here to Torrington. And uh, John's is the small uh, headstone here on the ground. And it says uh, Continental Army, Revolutionary War. And then his wife Elizabeth is, is right next to him uh, there. So the proof of his uh, service in the, in the war in the Continental Line, this comes out of the Pennsylvania State Archives. There are several volumes of these books. And uh, you can see his name right there, John Barry Private. So we know that he was paid for his services in the military. And then in the fifth series, volume four of the State Archives, we've got over here on the right-hand side, uh, you can barely see it, but it says John Barry. And then there's an annotation that says, In Chief's Guards. So that was another name for George Washington's uh, personal security detachment. So. And then on top of that, in Valley Forge, if you look through their records, they show him as being a, a lifeguard. That's another name for it, uh, for several months at Valley Forge as well. So that's, that's how we know for sure that this indeed did happen, and uh, he, he was there. All right, moving on to Elizabeth. 
Again, she was born in Ireland, Ireland in 1759. Um, same, same information, don't need to regurgitate all that. So when she came over, her, her sister, her name was Anne. Uh, they both uh, decided uh, to uh, follow the Continental Army and become nurses. Um, I don't know, at that time there weren't really too many women, they just figured that that was the best way to provide a service to uh, the, the colonies and, and the fight for independence, so they were nurses. And then later on, um, this, is, this is kind of the cool part, she actually uh, enlisted in the, in the army and became a, a ranger on the frontier. And uh, those rangers, this was the foundation for what we have today as the, the ranger the U.S. Army Rangers, the Special Forces groups, all that stuff. This is where they originated from, was front Rangers of the Frontier. <clears throat> and her authentication for her service is again in the Pennsylvania State Archives. And uh, you can see her name there. We've got the, the Rangers on the Frontier. She enlisted in Northumberland County. And there's her name, Elizabeth Gilmore. And again, we don't really have a description of her. Um, but I do have uh, something out of one of my books from the family that their church minister back in Cannesburg said that she was the most intelligent woman in his congregation. So that's all we really know about Elizabeth. <clears throat> so a little bit about uh, more about her. So there, there were several ranger companies. Uh, hers, unfortunately, was not named, but like I said, there was 10 or 12 of them, and that was their job was to range the frontier on the western side of Pennsylvania. That's where uh, the natives and uh, a lot of the loyalist uh, militias were, were at, uh, creating hate and discontent while the main British and American armies were fighting over here by Philadelphia up into New York and, and off the map. So <clears throat> even though we don't have a lot of information, we do know that her family was around Lancaster County she enlisted in Northumberland County, which is just north of there. And uh, through the history books, Northumberland County was one of the most vulnerable areas in Pennsylvania, attacked multiple times by local, local, local loyalist militias and warriors from the Iroquois Six Nations who were allied with the British. On July 3rd, 1778, more than 300 patriots were killed in Exeter and Wyoming, Pennsylvania by the Iroquois Raiders, and those were just right there in the Wyoming Valley, just next door. Afterwards, Ranger companies were sent to that area in the summer of 1778 after they uh, left Valley Forge through 1779 to quell the violence and executed several offensive campaigns against the Iroquois villages to destroy their combat effectiveness, in which they were successful in doing. So, <clears throat> kind of gives you an idea what the, the mission of the Rangers were and most likely what Elizabeth was doing after they left uh, Valley Forge. <clears throat> and because Valley Forge is, you know, most like, well, we know it's from family stories. This is regardless where they met and the romance blossomed. Uh, we're going to talk just a few facts about Valley Forge. And we were fortunate enough to visit there, spend a whole day, and it's a pretty cool place if anybody ever gets to uh, get back to that area and, and see it. <clears throat> they do have quite a few of these log structures that are recreated to show what the barracks look like. And I have a video here we're going to watch real quick while I give you some facts and some statistics on Valley Forge. All right, so General Washington and his staff picked Valley Forge due to the terrain. A naturally elevated plateau that was advantageous to defend, as well as political and, and environmental considerations. So further on into the video, you'll see that, uh, that you're up on top of this plateau and you can actually see down downhill. So that's why they picked it, because it's harder to fight uphill than it is to uh, and defend uphill from um, offensive forces. The other reason that they picked Valley Forge is it's only 25 miles away from Philadelphia, which is where the Continental Congress was. And at this time, the British came in and they took Philadelphia and, and the Continental Congress had to evacuate. So politically, uh, Washington wanted to make sure that the, the Continental Army was nearby just to give people 
um, some faith and confidence that they haven't been abandoned and that something was going to happen in the future. <clears throat> so the Continental Army was 12,000 soldiers as well as 400 women and children when they entered Valley Forge on December 19, 1777, and they left on June 19, 1778. Between 1,300 and 1,600 log structures like this were built, which included soldiers' barracks, sheds, and the shelter for the livestock. There were 25 bake ovens that were built to supply the Army daily with 10 to 12,000 loaves of bread. Contrary to belief, the winter at Valley Forge that season really wasn't that harsh. It was, there were a lot harder winters. Um, and you know, the history books and kind of what people say is there was a lot of soldiers that died from hypothermia and the cold. That's not quite true. Uh, actually, very few soldiers died from cold and exposure, but mostly were from malnutrition, which was exacerbated by, which exacerbated the low immunity to diseases. Um, and those diseases, uh, the number one killer, that was the number one killer of soldiers at Valley Forge. So you've got scabies, typhoid, dys dysentery, influenza, smallpox, those were the main threats for soldiers that were there. And this was because the living conditions were absolutely filthy. Garbage, human excrement, uh, butchered animals. When they got there, everybody was just kind of doing their own thing. And uh, when you do that with 12,000 or more people, it's going to get messy real quick. And uh, you start walking around in that and people are definitely gonna get sick. So, um, Washington later on appointed a new quartermaster general named uh, Nathaniel Green, and uh, he took charge of that to reorganize the supply chain and make it more effective. And one of these things that they did was they built a bridge across the Schuylkill River, which is to the north of Valley Forge, enabling local farmers in that area uh, that were contracted by the U.S. Army to provide food and forage for soldiers and, and livestock. So after that, uh, things got a little bit better. And then over, over the six months of Valley Forge, around 2,000 soldiers died. <coughs> All right, so here we've got a, a map of Valley Forge. We're going to dive a little bit more into John Berry and his... Uh, service with the 10th Pennsylvania Regiment. So down here in the southern half is uh, where the 10th Pennsylvania was located when they entered Valley Forge with uh, General Anthony Wayne. And in that area they do have a, a little monument there. And that's where we took the picture and there are a couple remnants of the original buildings. Uh, I believe that was a chimney um, right next door to uh, this, this monument here. All right, so then while they're here, this is when John, Private John Berry was selected to become a lifeguard for General Washington. So he moved from the south in March of 1778 after being selected up here to uh, General Washington's headquarters, which is in the northwestern corner of Valley Forge. And my computer's really slow. So this is the house. I believe it was owned by Isaac Potts. So he graciously uh, gave it to General Washington and his staff. So this is where they operated out of uh, while they were at Valley Forge. And you can see in, I think this picture here, about 100 yards to the rear, there's these little log cabins and that's a better picture of them right here. This is where all the lifeguards, uh, General Washington's uh, personal security de detail lived. So they weren't too far away. So that's where Private Barry uh, ended up um, for the next couple months at, uh, at Valley Forge. And we got a little bit more information about uh, these guys. So there's their banner that they served under. Their motto was conquer or die. And they had several different names that they went by. The two main ones were the lifeguards and the chief's guards. And there weren't there very many of them, 180 to 250 during the entire uh, portion of the Revolutionary War. So uh, I guess this is a very prestigious and, and really cool thing about my family history is that my grandfather was selected by a regimental commander and there were only four per regiment that were handpicked to serve and protect General Washington and, and discharge those duties. 
The other nice, the other cool thing is that uh, Washington um, wanted all 13 colonies represented, so there was a unification. And we get a little bit better idea of maybe what uh, John looked like because General Washington had uh, some specific guidance for his regimental commanders when uh, he picked the soldiers to serve as his lifeguards. He didn't want just anybody. So he said, I want sober, honest soldiers with good behavior. I need them to be at a height between five feet eight and five foot 10 inches, handsome and well-made, clean and spruce. He wanted good looking soldiers to represent him and, and his staff, I guess. <laughs> so how many, how many people know who uh, Baron Von Steuben is? Any history buffs out there? Okay, got one. So Baron Von Steuben was a Prussian officer that came uh, specifically to retrain the whole Continental Army while they were at Valley Forge. When they came in, they were uh, all jacked up. They, they couldn't shoot, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't march, they couldn't keep pace. Their bayonet skills were terrible. They couldn't shoot. They were in bad shape. That's why they kept getting their butts kicked. So uh, General or Baron von Steuben came in, and uh, he, he took all the drill manuals and consolidated them into one. And then he, he started training 12,000 soldiers. Well, he's only one guy. So one guy can't train 12,000 soldiers in about six months. So he asked General Washington if he could take his lifeguards and have them help him train those 12,000 soldiers while at Valley Forge. And Washington approved that. So Private Barry was one of those that took part in retraining and rebluing 12,000 soldiers. Um, and when they marched out of Valley Forge in the, in the summer, they were 100 times better and more prepared to fight than when they, were walked in, when they walked in there. The unfortunate thing about uh, the records of the lifeguards is that they survived the war and a lot of movement, and then unfortunately, most of those records were destroyed in a fire at the Navy Yard in 1815. So we just don't have a whole lot more information about uh, lifeguards and their service. All right, so that wraps up uh, John and Elizabeth with their service. So the war is over, and then they decide they want to, uh, to get some land and figure out what they're gonna do after the war. So first of all, they settle by Elizabeth's father on their farm here in Lancaster County. And then on December 3rd, 1789, John purchased 400 acres called the Bloomfield property, uh, six miles west of Cannonsburg. Around the same time, he's working for a guy named jo Dr. John McMillan, who is the founder of Jefferson College. Anybody heard of that? Okay. <clears throat> and that was in Cannonsburg. It's, it's undetermined how John knew Dr. McMillan, being that Cannonsburg is 250 miles away from Lancaster to, to uh, Cannonsburg there. So we kinda just not sure about that, but one question that I have that uh, hopefully I can get some more research and confirmation on is that uh, maybe with Elizabeth uh, being a ranger on the frontier and a lot of Indian attacks happening on the west side of the state as well, that maybe she ran into him because Dr. McMillan was, was over here at that time and, and uh, there's, there's documents and, and things that say that he actually evacuated because the Indians had attacked uh, that whole area. So maybe, maybe that's how they knew each other, we're, we're not quite sure, but they did move west to Cannonsburg and uh, the Bloom, Bloomfield property is only six miles away from the 251 acre uh, Washington property. So if you know any history about George Washington, he was a surveyor. He was a British officer uh, in the French and Indian War. And for his services during that time, uh, Britain awarded him quite a bit of property in uh, the western part of uh, the U, well, not the US, but the colonies, uh, western Pennsylvania being one. And in this particular piece, he was awarded 2,813 acres uh, north of Cannonsburg. So as he became president, he just didn't have enough time to really do anything with this property. So he sold it to a guy named Matthew Ritchie. Matthew Ritchie died and that was passed down to his executor. Uh, his name was, I think, Alexander Addison. And then at that point, Alexander Addison said, I need to dispose of this land. So he put it all up for sale. And uh, John and Elizabeth Gilmore uh, purchased 251 acres of property that used to belong to George Washington. 
and that happened in March of 1802. So uh, <clears throat> this is very meticulous work, but I was able to figure out where the property lines are and overlay it onto Google Maps. So uh, this is over by Southview, Pennsylvania, uh, north of Cannonsburg, and um, the uh, blue star here is where the house is. And then this is just a, a very strong guesstimate of what the 251 acres look like. I'm still looking for the plat so I can properly dry that, draw that out. And while we were there in Pennsylvania, we were actually able to uh, locate it and uh, drive up there and, and check it out. Unfortunately, nobody was home, so we, uh, we went in real quick and uh, took some pictures and said, hey, this is pretty cool. I got some dirt because that's what I do and uh, and then we uh, went along our merry little way but this house is uh, really old it was built back in the early well about I would say 1820s 1830s and there's the barn we really really wanted to go in the barn dad's small we could have fit him through a window but he didn't want to do it so all we got were some pictures. <laughs> and now we're moving on to uh, William Gilmore, uh, one of John and Elizabeth's sons. So this guy was uh, pretty active as well in his life. He was born in 1781. Um, he was born in Lancaster, which is on the east side of the state, and he actually traveled with John uh, when he was a child as they settled on the west side of the state. In 1804, he married Jane McConnell, they had a lot of kids too, eight total. And uh, so he was well known for a couple things. Uh, the first one real quick was he was a justice of the peace for 15 years in the Cecil and Chartiers townships. And then he decided he was gonna get into the sheep business. So in 1821, he purchased a couple ewes and one ram from a guy named W.R. Dickinson from Steubenville, Ohio. And then over the next 26 years, he refined the quality of his flock through meticulous observation of physical characteristics of the animals themselves, the quality of their wool, uh, and the animal's hardiness to endure harsh northeast winters. He developed pedigrees and ultimately named them blacktop Spanish merinos due to their darker coats. He sustained a flock of around 500 until 1847 when he decided to, I guess, retire and moved to Cannonsburg, at which time the flock was split in half and uh, it was given to both his sons, William and Matthew. Uh, the blacktop wool was highly sought after and his sheep production and pedigrees became so popular uh, that after his death, the Blacktop Spanish Merino Sheep Breeders Association was created to historically document all the flocks collectively into a Blacktop Sheep Registry. And I've got a copy right here, uh, which right now currently are at seven volumes. And I don't think there's probably going to be any more. So there's seven total. So if anybody wants to take a look at this later, it is up here to, to browse at. So if you go to Cabela's or Bass Pro Shops and you buy some wool socks and it says Merino wool, most likely that probably originated from, from a berry flocks of sheep from the Merino black tops. So another thing that uh, William was uh, pretty hardcore on, was he was a prominent abolitionist and a, a big supporter of the Underground Railroad. So it is documented uh, that his home in the Peach Garden which is uh, located uh, one mile south of Cannonsburg. It was 300 acres when he bought it. Uh, that property, as well as the home of, his, of one of his sons, John Berry, uh, were actively used as part of the central network to harbor slaves escaping to the north and finance for the logistics of doing so. And the Berries were closely associated with another prominent abolitionist family, and their last name was the McNary's. So keep that in mind because that will come into play a little bit later on um, in this presentation. All right, so then we're moving into Matthew Berry. There's a lot of like Johns and Matthews and everything in here. It's pretty confusing um, once you get into it pretty deep. So Matthew, he, uh, he really didn't seek any political positions 
and focused most of his life around the continued development of the blacktop Spanish merino sheep industry and a great number of his flocks in various a great number of flocks in various states traced their origin to to his flocks so he had a everybody came to him because that was the big thing back in those days everything was made out of wool and everyone wanted uh, some merino sheep from from the berry flock um, they had three sons. He married Margaret Wilson in 1847, and he passed away in 1914 at 90 years old. And here's a, a pic, couple pictures out of one of those uh, sheep registry books. This is how they, uh, I guess, got their point across to potential buyers and whatnot. And uh, those those came from the Berry, Matt Berry and their Matthew Berry and sons. Okay, so then Matthew had had some kids, and then uh, one of those was Samuel Willison, and he was born in 1850, and he was kind of the same way. He he really wasn't uh, into politics or anything. He just kind of kept to himself and and focused on uh, continued sheep breeding in that industry. Um, most of them, as you can tell, they were they were all uh, fairly religious and Presbyterian. Um, and whatnot. So with him, he was a charter member and ruling elder of the Houston United Presbyterian Church, and we were actually able to go and visit that church. I've got a picture of that here in a second. So at this point in time, when Matthew retired, he had 300-acre peach garden. So he split that in half, and uh, 140 acres was willed to to Samuel. And once again. I've got the plat, and it's actually up here on the display table, but I was able to pinpoint exactly where that property was. And while we were back in, in Cannonsburg, uh, we were able to drive through there and, and check that out. And unfortunately, it's, uh, they've got a subdivision and, and something else going in there, so you really can't see anything. It was kind of unfortunate, but hey, it is, it is what it is. But in 1924, this is what the peach garden looked like where Samuel lived. Very nice buildings for those, for those times. Big, big barn, nice cleared land, and uh, that's what it looked like in 1924. And unfortunately, all those buildings are no longer there now. They've all been raised. And then we talked briefly about his uh, uh, participation in building this church. And again, this is what it looks like, and we were uh, lucky enough that it was open that day so we actually got to go inside and take a look at it and it is a very beautiful church he did a very good job with with that all right we're getting closer now we're now we're into uh we're getting closer to goshen county so, <clears throat> so this is my great grandfather matthew bill willison berry he was born in 1879 uh, the last of our lineage to uh, be over in pennsylvania because in 1897, at the age of 18, he moved from Cannonsburg to Greeley, Colorado. Not quite sure why he moved specifically to Greeley, but uh, we know that he had asthma, and someone told him that the drier air and higher elevation would help him with his ailment, so he, he came west. <coughs> at that point, he met uh, Lois Reed, and courted her for several years before getting married on February 6, 1907. And in the 13 years that Bill lived in Greeley, it's unknown what his occupation was, but it is a strong assumption that a portion of that time was spent uh, working for his father-in-law uh, named John Franklin Reed, J.F. Reed. And uh, I've got some documents that say that you know, they say that he was a wealthy farmer. Not sure how much property he owned, um, but they lived in, in Greeley for for quite a while, and uh, so that's that's where they kind of started off at. So in 1910, Bill and Lois moved to Goshen County and temporarily, temporarily lived in the Presbyterian Church Parsonage before moving to a farm two miles north of Torrenton, owned by Lois's father, John F. Reed. So we're going to skip ahead a couple slides to give you, well, so we can tie all this together so you know why. Uh, Bill and Lois moved from Greeley to Torrenton. And that is because of Lois's father, 
John F. Reed. So he was an elder of the Presbyterian Church in Greeley. And he was appointed by the Presbytery of Colorado to organize a congregation right here in Torrington. So that's why he came here, because he had they put him on a mission and, and he was going to build a congregation. So the original church building, which is up here in this corner, that was completed and dedicated on October 7th, 1906. And unfortunately, about a year later, in 1907, it burnt to the ground. So then John uh, went ahead and, and became a member of the rebuilding committee. And uh, they built a new church. And that was dedicated on January 24th, 1909. And I actually have that little brochure down here if anybody wants to look at it, the dedication ceremony. And uh, this is the church here, and it's still standing at 2141 West A Street. And it's the Christ Reformed uh, Presbyterian Church. That's who has it uh, today. Um, so once they outgrew that church, um, then in 1956, which is the whole right-hand side here, um, the cornerstone in, in 1956 was laid for the first Wyoming United Presbyterian Church at its present location, which is right across from uh, Coyer Funeral Home at 2972 Main Street. So out of all, all three of these churches, a lot of the Berry relatives had something to do with their, I guess, creation and, uh, and organization, and, and they were all members of, of one or all of, of these churches at one point in time. All right, so now we know why uh, Bill and Lois came to Torrington is because of Lois's father. So while here, John F. Reed, Bill Berry, and uh, Bill's brother-in-law, his name was Boyd, they formed the Torrington Land and Livestock Company up until 1918. And these farms consisted of four quarter sections that were adjacent to each other. And they developed this land so irrigation water would drain well and the water came out of the hill ditch. Anybody remember the hill ditch? Okay. Neither do I, because I wasn't, I wasn't in Georgia. Okay. So while they were, while they were farming, uh, they farmed uh, potatoes, barley, and alfalfa. So uh, up here, if you go north of uh, EWC on on West C Street that turns into the Van Tassel Highway. Uh, this, this is where uh, Bill and Lois lived. I think most of that should look familiar to quite a few of you. Probably most of the Prairie Center folks who come that way, maybe. <laughs> um, and then here we've got uh, Matthew Wilson Berry, and this is my grandpa, Walt, when he was a kid. And then down here they were uh, getting ready to plant uh, potatoes. So then in the 1920s, uh, Bill, he started to feed around 3,000 head of sheep uh, of lambs with a guy named H.W. Farr out of Greeley. And they also started a potato business in Torrington known as the Farr Produce Company. Anybody, does that name sound familiar? The, the Farr Produce Company, okay. <laughs> so this business later transitioned into something maybe a little bit more familiar, into a dry bean business and that was called the Far Wyoming Company. Maybe that one sounds a little bit more familiar. And Bill was active in, his, in this business until his death in 1950. So Bill and Lois saw all three of their sons serve during World War II and return safely home to pursue their own dreams and careers. Matthew, Bill, Willis, and Barry passed away on December 13th 1950 from a heart attack and Lois Berry passed away one month later on January 9th 1951 from a, a two-year battle with lung cancer uh, the obituaries that I found uh, hailed them as both as pioneers of Goshen County and Bill as a man of sound judgment with high integrity his kindly counsel was often sought by many of his friends and acquaintances so they a lot, I think a lot of folks uh, knew him very well in the uh, Torrington and Goshen County area here. So now we're getting into the, the final generation. This is my grandfather's generation. We're going to start with, uh, with the youngest. So one thing I wanted to uh, annotate here is there were actually four children. I think I forgot to mention that. Um, the first child that uh, 
that was born, her name was Ruth, and she, she was born on June 26, 1911, and she actually passed away as an infant. She only survived for one day, and, uh, and that was it. So um, obviously there's nothing about her other than a headstone up in the, the cemetery. So now we have three brothers. Franklin Samuel Berry is the youngest. He was born in uh, 1920. He uh, married Bernice Barker, who was a teacher in 1946. They had one daughter and two sons. And after he came back from World War II, uh, he, he farmed for 30 plus years north of, of Torrenton. Um, he was very active in the community uh, with the American Legion, the last squad club. He was on the school board, uh, the board for the irrigation ditches, so on and so forth. So he, he still remained pretty active. So while we're going to dig just a little bit deeper into something that happened with Frank while he was in World War II. <clears throat> so he was in the Army Air Corps. He was a sergeant. And he was the left waist gunner on a B-17G Flying Fortress. And was part of the 534th Bomb Squadron and the 381st Bomb Group. They had completed four missions and were on their fifth mission on September 3rd, 1944. Uh, when Sweet Patootie suffered the loss of three engines. So there's a little bit of discrepancy even between the crew because I've got a lot of emails from them uh, before they unfortunately all passed away uh, about what truly happened with the engines on this aircraft. Uh, some documents say that one engine took enemy fire and went out followed by a second engine and then uh, some other sources say that, uh, that three out of the four engines went out due to mechanical failure like all three at the same time. So when you have three engines out of four, I know Doug doesn't like to fly, <laughs> and I know why. Um, they're like, yep, this is not sustainable, so we're going to have to put it down, and they did. And they, they did a wheels-up landing in uh, near chalon sur seyon in France, 435 miles southeast of Paris. And uh, there's some pictures of, that is Sweet Patootie, that isn't another aircraft, that is, that is Uncle Frank's B-17 on the ground. So, one, everyone survived, all 10 crew members. There's 10 crew on a B-17, and uh, at that time, that was still German-occupied France, and they got rolled up and uh, just immediately became POWs. So they put these guys on a boxcar on a train headed towards Germany for a POW camp, and uh, Uncle Frank said that the train ride was really slow because the Allies kept uh, strafing and hitting the the train and blowing up the railroad tracks so they had to stop and and move boxcars and trains to other tracks and then those got hit so it was like four days of just non-stop trying to slowly make their way into Germany so with some American ingenuity what do Americans do heck no we're not going to be prisoners we're going to figure out a way to get out of this so <clears throat> they figured out a way to jimmy the the lock on the boxcar and they got it open and they actually escaped jumped off the car, off the train as it was going up a hill and, and got away. And uh, they sought refuge with a local French family. And at that time, we're talking, you know, 5th of September, D-Day was June 6th. So they're pushing towards Germany. And at that point, the Allies are going really fast. They're in open ground, um, rolling the Germans back. And a couple days later, they were actually liberated by Allied forces. And uh, the soldiers that uh, Uncle Frank talked to said, uh, do not go back to England by way of France because there's still pockets of German resistance. Most likely you'll either end up dead or, or captured again. So make your way down through North Africa and go around that way. So that's what they did. And uh, so with the help of the French underground, they made their way to Naples, Italy, which is the first location in which he was able to get a Western telegram off to uh, Bill and Lois. Uh, saying that he was okay, and I actually have both of those telegrams up here uh, So you can take a look at those and the pretty cool thing about this is that uh, uh, Bill and Lois uh, Received the one saying that he was okay just days before they got the one from The official one from the US government saying that he was missing in action, so Nobody was really freaking out. They were just happy and then they're like wow I need to really know this story what the heck happened um, okay, so after the death of Bill, Uncle Frank inherited the farm, which is two and a half miles north of Torrington, and this, this picture should probably look 
familiar. It's right on that 90 degree curve. Uh, beautiful big house, um, silos and all that stuff. That's where uh, Uncle Frank and Aunt Bernice lived. They raised hay, corn, beans, and fed some cattle on the side. And then he and my grandpa Walt were actually partners in the Berry Brothers cattle from 1949 to 1951. And then in 1980, they sold the farm and, and uh, Uncle Frank and Aunt Bernice moved to town. Now we're moving on to the middle brother, John Reed Berry. He was born in 1918. Uh, he was a businessman with the Far Wyoming Company. Uh, he, mil he married Billy Rodden. Uh, she, she grew up over in Lingle in, on October 6, 1946. And uh, both of them served in World War II. Aunt Billy was uh, a lieutenant in the Navy Nurses Corps and she served for two years. Uh, before World War II started, Uncle John uh, attended University of Wyoming and he was a member of the Sigma Nu fraternity. And then after World War II began, he joined the U.S. Army and served four years obtaining the, the rank, the officer rank of captain. And he was commissioned in, ser in the service branch of quartermaster. He served in the Pacific Theater for two and a half years with the 1st Cavalry Division. And he was discharged in November of 1945 and then he came back to Torrington and worked with uh, his dad, Matthew, at the Far Wyoming Company. And he also was pretty active in the community with the uh, city council, the Rotary Club, uh, Lions Club, so on and so forth. And now these pi pictures should be looking really familiar. So in 1961, Uncle John bought out the Farr family from the business and continued to operate it until he retired in 1986. At that time, the Farr Wyoming Company chapter came to a close and was sold to Kelly Bean Company, which still operates today. So every time we drive by Kelly Bean, the uh, oldest part of the building right here, the stucco, you can see up in the upper corner there, Far Wyoming Company, that's, that's pretty much what's left of, of my great-grandfather and uh, Uncle John's legacy is, is Kelly Bean there. All right, last but not least, we're moving on to uh, my grandfather, Walter Willison Berry. And he was born on the farm, that picture a couple slides ago out north of Torrington. And, uh, and that was in 1913. He attended the Lynn Burt School. Anybody, sound, does that sound familiar to anybody? Lynn Burt, okay. So he went to school there until it closed. And uh, while he was attending, he, my grandpa was really smart. He actually skipped two grades. He was a very intelligent man. Um, his, his mind was with him even, even till the day that he passed away. Like you could t ask him a multiplication question and he could just go like that. So he, he was a really smart guy. And uh, so then he moved into Torrington High School and he graduated high school at 16 years old. He was a, a pretty active uh, youth in the community, participating in, in 4-H Boy Scouts, the Booster Club, played baseball, basketball, all that stuff. In 1930, he was a member of the 4-H Livestock Judging Team. And uh, that, in that year, they won all three judging events. And that was at the Goshen County Fair, the Wyoming State Fair, and the Denver Stock Show. Um, so they were, they were pretty good judges. And I know we got a lot of folks here that uh, participated in livestock judging at some point in their life. So um, after all that, when he, he attended uh, University of Wyoming, so all three brothers attended UW. Um, and just like his brother John, he was a member of the Sigma Nu fraternity. And he participated in, on the UW livestock judging team. And in 1933, they competed at the Denver Stock Show and the International Livestock Expo in Chicago, and they placed 10th. So not, not too shabby. And he met my grandma, Alice Optal, in Torrington, where she had moved from Greeley to teach in Goshen County. Sometimes I'll refer to him as Opa. We call them Oma and Opa. So uh, while Opa was at UW, 
he became good friends with a guy named Cliff Hansen. That name should sound pretty familiar. So for those of you who do not know Cliff Hansen, he uh, later on was a 26th governor of the state of Wyoming, and he also did a stint as a U.S. Senator. <clears throat> and uh, Cliff had a ranch up in Jackson Hole, and uh, Opa went up there and worked for him uh, for several years in the late 1930s. And then when uh, World War II broke out, of course, everybody in that generation, they all, they all enlisted, and he did the same thing uh, and made it to sergeant and served from 1943 to 1946. And at the end of the war, which was on May 8th, 1945, he was still over in Germany. And uh, his unit was assigned to guard German SS soldiers that were prisoners of war. And uh, looking through a bunch of letters and everything that he wrote to Oma, uh, we, we found out that his duty, duty location was in and around Nuremberg, Germany. So anybody know what happened at Nuremberg after World War II? It was the Nuremberg Trials. Trials. So he put one and one together, and uh, he most likely was guarding prisoners that were uh, going to trial in Nuremberg for the autocracies that the Nazis did to the Jews and, and other people during World War II. After being discharged while well returned to Wyoming, and uh, once again worked for Cliff Hansen up through 1949, and at that time, and I think this is right, I hope so, <laughs> His two daughters, Anne and Elaine, were born in Jackson Hole. Very good. <laughs> and uh, my grandma, she was up there as well, and she actually cooked for the ranch crew. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. And then, in 1949, in October, this is when it gets uh, real close to home here, uh, he moved his family back to Torrington and established the Berry Ranch north of Torrington. So in the upper left-hand corner, this is a picture of their house, the ranch yard, in the early 1950s. And uh, his father, Matthew Bill Berry, bought this ranch from a guy named Bill Flora. And then how the Berry Ranch began was he attended a community auction and purchased 12 head of Hereford cows. That'll make the auctioners happy. <laughs> uh, to start his cow-calf operation with, and then later on he transitioned to breeding Hereford Angus crossbred cattle, uh, which is still in operation today, owned by my folks who are here tonight. And I have lots of good memories. Some days I wish I could go back there, because <coughs> life is life. And last but not least, <clears throat> got one more slide here. So, the only, there's only one object that remains that kind of binds the uh, Barry history and legacy together, and that's what we call the Barry Bell. So anybody who's gone into the ranch yard and seen this bell, maybe now you'll know the history behind it. So this bell hung at the Peach Garden property in Pennsylvania. And when that farm was sold in 1939, uh, Grandpa Matthew, Bill Berry, and Grandma Lois, and Opa, and Uncle Frank, they went back east to visit the farm one last time, and they brought this bell back with them. And the bell, um, in the, well, it was at Uncle Frank's farm for the longest time until they sold that in 1980, and then um, Opa brought it out to the ranch, and that's where it stands today. And it still gets used to ring people in for dinner and lunch and all that stuff. And when the, the pager goes off and people can't hear or are busy doing things, they can definitely hear the bell ding, 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 ding to uh, get your butt in the grass truck and uh, go fight, fight prairie fires. So that is it. That, uh, that's the Berry family history from 1775 up until, I guess, well, maybe not now, but through my grandfather's generation. So thank you very much. If, if anybody has any questions or anything, I can definitely try and answer those. And if not, I appreciate everybody coming. This is a, a big crowd, and thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Matt? I sure thank you, Matt. 
your your family is one of the nicest family in the whole world. Your uh, one of your uh, your uncle. Well, it it was your grandfather's brother. They bought one of my 4-H steers one year. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, it's, uh, that was, I mean, they really did support the community and everything. You're, you're from a good group of people. Well, thank you. <laughs> Matt, Appreciate you might that. just briefly touch on the Daughters of the American Revolution and the plaque that is back in the cemetery at Pennsylvania oh. for Elizabeth yep. Gilmore. <clears throat> I'm going to do this real quick because I know it's getting late. And my computer is, of course, really slow. <laughs> <laughs> So, we'll go to this first. I didn't know if I was going to have a whole lot of time to talk about this or not. So, of course, I talked about this being the original headstone of Elizabeth Berry. And uh, in the 1930s, the Daughters of the American Revolution, they, uh, they did their research and they found out her service in the military. So, they, they went ahead and... and uh, had this little monument built with this plaque and uh, this is what the plaque reads in memory of Elizabeth Gilmore who came to this country from the north of Ireland in the fall of 1777 a nurse in Washington's army at Valley Forge during the winter of 1777 to 78 a soldier of the American Revolution from Northumberland County in the company called Rangers on the Frontier as recorded in the Pennsylvania archives Elizabeth Gilmore and John Berry, a Continental soldier, were married in 1780, and together they continued in the Army until the close of the War of Independence. Elizabeth Gilmore Berry died August 21st, 1824. So the interesting thing that I find about this plaque is that in the 1930s they didn't have all the technology and the ability to research, so up here in the fall of 1777, you know, that's, that's not quite accurate. They were just going off of what they knew back then. And that's a cool thing about history. The more you research, the more you refine it, and the more accurate you can get. And that is my intent with my family history, is to continue researching and uh, getting the, the nitty gritty details and make as much of that, turn as many assumptions into facts so we know exactly where we came from. That's cool. Any more questions? You mentioned yeah. the Yeah. The McNairys? Yeah, you, you kind of skipped. So the McNairys, they were they were real big into, uh, they were abolitionists as well, and they were very good friends with the Berries. And uh, ultimately, so William, William Gilmore, they skipped a generation, and then William <coughs> Matthew, and then Samuel married Isabel McNary, which, which I mean, they're all friends, so that's that's how they were all tied together. They, they kind of all kept it together in the, the community there. And there's actually a lot of streets and stuff uh, that are named McNary. So they were pretty popular people back in the Cannonsburg area there in Pennsylvania. There was a lot of them. When we walked through the cemetery, I don't know how many headstones had McNary's and berries on them. There was a lot. <laughs> we just had enough time to find, find our people. <laughs> so. Did you have a question, Chrissy? Actually, uh, oh, okay. Asked. Asked it, so. All right. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I do have one comment: is that I taught math. I had I had the privilege of teaching Matthew for five and a half years at Prairie Center School, and I'll tell you what I this is so him. <laughs> From kindergarten on, I mean, he was dressed in camouflage. He was always this enthusiastic young child who wanted to know more 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 and so I'm just so proud of you Matt that well, you. you've done this and I mean it is just exactly what you meant to do and be. I appreciate that. If there are no more questions by what a wonderful family history I mean so much Americanism is a in it. it, it's one. Yeah, my, my patriot blood runs pretty deep. Pure, For yes, any of you who know who know me, I'm yeah. Don't don't tread on me. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, we'd like to give you the 
oh. historical calendar. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Your presentation. All right. And I guess if anybody, if, if anybody has time to stick around, there's a whole bunch of stuff here to peruse and take a look at. And if that conjures up any more questions, we can try and answer those for you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming. And next um, next month, Linda Fabian, who is the executive secretary of the uh, State Historical Society, will be here um, to tell us about the history of our capital. So if any of you are interested in that subject, she will certainly give another wonderful program. But this was just out.